is an audio review of W.E.B. Du Bois, Chapter 7, Theories of Social Behavior. Okay, so Du Bois was so important to sociology and how we understand race in sociology, and he is the basis of some of the theoretical branches, such as race conflict theory and other critical theories. So we're going to talk a little bit briefly about, you know, some of the context of the time period in which he was developing his theories, though, of course, he lived to be 95, so that time period is pretty vast. And really a little bit about his biography that connects, you know, so you get a better, deeper understanding of the person. Okay, so Du Bois was the first sociologist to understand that while slavery had existed in other times and places in the world, the transatlantic slave trade was unlike any other form of slavery. And participation in the transatlantic slave trade was a foundational event in the history of the United States. He was the first social theorist to critically remark on the global racial order and to understand not only the economic but the racial underpinnings of the European colonization of Africa, Asia, India, and Latin America. So we'll talk in a moment about the color line and his arguments about the color line, but even his own experiences are really a testament to the existence and pervasiveness of the color line. Despite his exceptional work and sociological insights, he was ignored by fellow American sociologists in his day, and his work on African American communities was neither well known or well respected. So at the turn of the 20th century, when it comes to racism and the denial of humanity, Racism at the turn of the 20th century impeded most social scientists from having a coherent understanding of race. Most scientists and essayists in the 19th and early 20th century denied the very humanity of African Americans. They believed that white and black brains were very different. They assumed that black brains were inferior, connecting their social racism to their perception of brains. They thought black brains would weigh less or have prefrontal deficiencies, which would cause inferior, quote-unquote, psychic faculties, especially reason, judgment, self-control, or voluntary inhibitions. But Du Bois challenged these assumptions of racism, and in doing research argued with empirical support that it was not racial inferiority that caused differing social conditions between whites and blacks. It was racial prejudice, which accounted for the fact that, you know, more people of color were living in poverty, had less literacy, had higher morbidity, uh, especially for black communities, that that was the result of prejudice, and the inequality that came from that. Du Bois was also alone in looking at the connections between race and class, and the complicated ways in which they're intertwined. He was ahead of his time and is still important in our thinking and methodology towards these connections. So in the 19th and early 20th centuries, African Americans were marginalized, both explicitly, meaning they were treated as second-class citizens and not afforded all rights, and implicitly, meaning their lives and their experiences were ignored from formal sociological theorizing. So as a result, when you know looking at Du Bois's work, he teaches us that we need to broaden our notions of theory if we want to uncover ideas of African Americans who lived during that racist period because they were excluded from analysis. Theories were done and really focused only on white communities. Okay, so Du Bois had a long life, so there's a lot to cover to truly explore his biography. But we don't have time for that here, so I will just touch on a couple of things. But obviously there's much more to know about him or to explore in his writings, his philosophies, his activism, his experiences, than what I can fit into this brief audio lecture. Right? So Du Bois is born in 1868 in Massachusetts. And, you know, it was as only as a child that he started to notice that race was setting him apart from his schoolmates. And though you know, a race consciousness would seem to run counter to the individualism and egalitarianism supposedly underlying American society. Du Bois maintained that in a racist society, democracy could not be colorblind. So, you know, that's something that comes up again in his work later on. So Du Bois was the first black graduate in his high school's history. And in 1892, he received a master's degree in philosophy from Harvard and set off to study further at the University of Berlin. So Du Bois applied philosophy to a historical interpretation of race relations to take his steps towards sociology as the science of human action. So he began teaching in Wilberforce University, a small African Methodist Episcopal school in central Ohio, and he published his second book, The Philadelphia Negro, A Social Study, 1899, which was the first sociological text on African-American community that was published in the United States. 
1896, he gets married to Nina Gomer, and the following year their child was born. And it was perhaps his deepest sorrow losing his child that prompted a more soft and sympathetic tone that was apparent in his masterpiece, The Souls of Black Folks, that was published in 1903. His child, um, you know, died at only, I think, what was it, like eight, 18 months old? And then so in 1897, he began teaching at the Atlanta University in Georgia, where he remained until 1910 and wrote many, many things during that time period. And after arriving in Atlanta, he turned his attention to more political activism. In 1905, he helped found a militant civil rights organization called the Niagara Movement. In 1910, he left his academic post at Atlanta University to work full time for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the NAACP, in New York City, an association that evolved out of the Niagara Movement. He also challenged the laws against miscegenation, asserting that a black man should be able to marry any sane grown person who wants to marry him. He was devoted to the you know, Pan-African Movement, Right? He was interested in socialist political alternatives. So he called for the creation of a unified socialist African state and began to devote himself almost exclusively to the Pan-African movement. From the 1940s until his death in 1963, Du Bois wrote eloquently and provocatively about the twin evils of colonialism and imperialism. So what's interesting too is once you get to the Cold War <clears throat> in the early 1950s, Du Bois himself became a target for the Cold War. The Justice Department ordered him to register as an agent of a foreign principal, but he refused to do so and faced a possible fine of $10,000 and five years in federal prison. After a long and costly trial, he was acquitted, but his passport was retained by the Justice Department and he was refused the right to travel abroad. Du Bois was prevented from returning to the United States as the American consulate refused to renew his passport. So Du Bois and his wife had no choice but to renounce their American citizenship. In March 1963, they began, or they became uh, citizens of Ghana, and less than six months later, at the age of 95, Du Bois died. Okay, so moving on to some of his intellectual influences and core ideas. So Du Bois' three types of research. His first type of research was empirical studies, illuminating the social conditions of African Americans, right, where he literally went into people's homes and asked them very detailed things, and he went to like thousands of homes to do this research. Um, the second type of research was interpretive essays informed by careful historical research and personal experience, as well as keen observation that emphasized the subjective experience and sources of inequality. And then his third type of research was explicitly political essays focusing on pan-Africanist and socialist solutions to inequality and racism. So obviously, you know, he, he threw criticism all over the place and also, you know, looked at criticism of the United States and really of the black community itself. So in Du Bois' first book, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade to the United States of America, 1638 to 1870, he harshly condemns the United States for its moral and political hypocrisy and the inability of its leaders to check this, quote, real, existent, growing evil, end quote, that led straight to the Civil War. At the same time, Du Bois did not hesitate to criticize the black community. He censured black parents for not sufficiently reinforcing the value of a formal education. He assailed black churches for not adequately combating social corruption and moral decay. He also lamented the existence of the, quote, the unusual substratum of loafers and semi-criminals who will not work, end quote. So Du Bois believed that the burden for winning freedom and justice for all African Americans was really resting on the shoulders of those who were best prepared educationally and economically. So in 1935, Du Bois published Black Reconstruction in America. The book was based on ignored data about Blacks' role in Reconstruction era, and it challenged the elitism that pervaded historical studies at the time period. Black Reconstruction uncovered the latent elitism and ethnocentrism of the entire historical profession, which under the guise of scientific objectivity was actually a font of racist oppression as historians' monographs reflected their prejudices. You know, that kind of old adage, history is written by the, by the winners kind of thing. So in both his history and his sociology, Du Bois refused to write from a position of value neutrality, even as he strove for truth. And so this is a stance that makes perfect sense in the contemporary context of humanistic and interpretive social science. But at the time period, it was incredibly unheard of and also was part of the reason that people challenged his methodologies. 
Okay, so Du Bois's approach was a precursor to the interpretive shift that began to emerge in sociology and the social sciences in general in the 1980s. So think about that. This is a dude born in the 1860s, and <laughs> some of the stuff he was talking about in like the 1930s wasn't really picked up by the full discipline of sociology until, you know, the 1980s. So, you know, 60 years <laughs> later, they were like, hey, maybe that guy had a good point. So interpretive social scientists emphasize that, com that complete objectivity isn't possible or desirable. And from that point of view, the notion that truth is arrived at through objectivity is unfounded. So we can't adequately capture the richness and complexity of reality if you're only using objectivist tools because they're laden with subjectivity and interpretation. We can and must use our own subjective experience and humanistic understandings in order to explore and explain the complexities of reality. So he also looked at, you know, the, the persistence of racial inequality in society. And so for, you know, it's interesting the book talks about how for a lot of people, the election of Barack Obama as president in 2008 and his re-election in 2012 indicated how much progress there had been when it comes to racial justice in the United States. But it also led some to argue that, you know, the problem of the color line itself has been resolved, right? There is no racism anymore. Look, we had a black president at the end. Right? However, two major caveats remain to that. First, huge reservoirs of inequality in the United States persist. In pivotal areas, you have education inequality, housing inequality, you know, inequality in health outcomes and access and resources, um, inequality in the criminal justice system, and dire racial and class inequalities remain throughout society. And secondly, Obama's presidency spurned a significant backlash, right? Obama's presidency you know, um, did raise the stakes for the American ideal. But remember, <laughs> there was this guy that came out and said that Obama was like a secret Muslim Kenyan, um, led this thing called a birther movement to force him to show his birth certificate, which he did. And then um, that guy, Donald Trump, then became the, the president afterwards. So <laughs> there is some argument there that there was quite a backlash to the idea of the first black president in the United States. So clearly, as you know, um, Trump in many ways kind of lifted up a rock and, you know, all of the seedy underbelly of racism that had been kind of hidden by respectability politics in the 1990s since that time period really started to come out and play. So, you know, for those people that kind of hadn't seen the ways in which racism had changed in its form and to more, you know, um, kind of coded attacks or dog whistle politics or things of this nature, um, you know, it just became much more blatant again when people started grabbing tiki torches and talking about Jews not replacing them. And, you know, all of these very, very racialized um, groups, these what they call themselves white nationalists. It's a nice way to brand themselves when it's just, you know, white supremacists, basically, like the old KKK, but rebranded that there's been a huge resurgence in these groups since the election of Barack Obama. So clearly the idea that is that that wasn't that wasn't the end of racism <laughs> right so anyway okay um now uh, another interesting topic that du bois talks about is um you know the place of african americans in in the united states so it's interesting that the book talks about the kind of parallels between obama's journey and that of du bois himself meaning they are both of the talented 10th of their respective generations, meaning they are the most highly educated, they come from kind of the most cultured backgrounds. And so, you know, um, what's interesting though is that like, the basically these divides still exist. This idea that there's like the good ones, as they call it. Um, there's actually this great book I've been reading recently called One of the Good Ones. And, you know, this idea that there's this you know, upper stratum of 10% of the group that somehow is really high achieving and, you know, better somehow. And that basically it becomes a situation of trying, basically Du Bois is trying to convince white society of the worth of African Americans by proving it through education, through hard work and dedication, through things like this. And, you know, it wasn't until much later on in his life, near his death, that he realized that that wasn't going to work, <laughs> that you could you could be an outstanding um, citizen and representative and all of these things. But, you know, the idea was that's going to win the hearts and minds. That's going to shift the, 
the kind of notions of race and society, and that undergirded his ideas of the talented tenth. So what's interesting, though, is that even to this day, you know, whether it was in Du Bois' time, the kind of divides that existed that were hangers on from slavery. Remember, he was born only a couple of years after emancipation. So the notions in society that had divided groups of African Americans into, you know, kind of their rank within slavery, meaning were they working inside, were they working outside, that kind of thing, um, and the different kind of positionality related to that, that, you know, as, as history evolved, it just became basically the divide between good citizens who are black, like the Obamas, and bad citizens who are black, like um, people who are living in the inner city, who are gang members, or, you know, the kind of, I talk about politics of that time period. I think we talked about that in class the other day, the idea of the, the um, welfare queen kind of trope, which again, was such an interesting historical backstory. If you want to talk to me about that more, I'd love to talk to you about it. But it was basically the whole trope is based on one woman, but it really helped Ronald Reagan kind of push himself into power. So anyway, this idea that African Americans are really vulnerable to these symbolic classification schemes that say that there's good people and there's bad people, and that you can basically be classified within that and outside of your control. And then moving to double consciousness briefly, this refers to a split or separation of the self from being both black and being American. So he argued that living as a member of a non-dominant race creates a fracture in your sense of identity. So basically you see yourself through the perspective of your own eyes, but you also see yourself through the perspective of how America sees you. And if America sees you as not fully a person, you both basically have both of those consciousnesses, the double consciousness. So double consciousness enabled Du Bois to commune with both Harvard intellectuals and Philadelphians from the Seventh Ward, where he did his research, where he like went into thousands of people's homes. And it was overt in the person of Barack Obama, whose political success was rooted not only in his personal charisma and intelligence, but in his ability to maneuver in multiple symbolic worlds. Okay, so moving on to Du Bois's theoretical orientation, Du Bois is theoretically multidimensional, and this is because he has different ways of going about the work and different methodologies, and with those different methodologies have different theoretical connections. So Du Bois's work illuminates the intertwined structural and subjective cases and, you know, the consequences of class, race, and racism. So his multidimensionality is evident in the different approaches he uses. In terms of order, Du Bois tended to be collectivist in orientation, he was primarily interested in examining how broad social and cultural patterns shaped individual behavior and perceptions. In terms of action, Du Bois continually emphasized both race and racism are formed by social structural forces, and that they're lived and felt experiences. And Du Bois powerfully demonstrated how race and racism are rooted in take-it-for-granted symbolic structures, thereby reflecting the non-rational realm. So Du Bois described the color line as the relations of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asian and African, in American, and in islands of the sea. On one hand, the color line explicitly addresses the objective historical and in, in, in institutional, meaning specifically colonial, dimensions of race. But at the same time, the color line has important subjective or non-rational dimensions as well. Du Bois not only examines race in its objective, demographic, and historical aspects, but also addresses race as a symbolic and an experiential reality. And then, of course, with the concept of double consciousness, Du Bois uses the term to refer to a split or separation of the self from being both black and American. So again, double consciousness is referring to a subjective consequence of being black in America at the level of the individual. And in contrast to Marx's concept of alienation, which applies only to the working class in capitalism, the theoretical power of double consciousness is that it can be used to discuss any array of social groups from the disabled to transgendered to undocumented populations. It can be applied in many contexts. And then when looking at the, de the veil and dehumanization, dehumanization that comes from the veil, Du Bois used this metaphor of the veil to describe the process in which skin color becomes both an objective and a subjective distancing mechanism. So as the dominant group, whites take the white world for granted, and they have no need to come to know the black world. By contrast, those who live behind the veil of color have to adapt to the white world in order to live in it. 
so they learn to see the world from their own point of view and from the vantage point of the other. So Du Bois described how it felt to be treated as a second-class citizen, as a dog or a slave. So speaking to the individual or non-rational realm, he illuminates the profound dehumanization at the heart of racism. Okay, so in his book, The Souls of Black Folks, he exposes a political schism in the black community. So it's important, it's an important work, and he's looking at, you know, um, other arguments at the time, specifically, you know, Booker T. Washington and others, who, um, you know, Du Bois basically had very different philosophy from Booker T. Washington. And, you know, this Booker T. Washington believed in what, he, what was called a graduist, gradualist solution to the issue of suffrage and his notion that the Negro education should be primarily in the form of trade schools. So basically, you know, um, while Du Bois was saying that, you know, uh, black people had every capability as white people and that they should be given the same opportunities, Booker T. Washington was much more saying, okay, yeah, sure, but let's just like slowly get there. <laughs> like, let's get a little bit of rights. Um, and really capitulating to some of the racial notions of the time period of inferiority, saying, sure, education's important, but let's just do it for trade schools. And so, um, you know, there was quite a difference in this. And actually, this is explored further. There's a book, again, this is a brief audio review, so I don't have all the time to get into it, but there's this great book called Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram X. Kendi, the guy who wrote the book uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. And he uses different uh, racial theorists throughout time to explore those time periods in which they were in. And he does use W.E.B. Du Bois as one of them. And he talks at length about the kind of um, schisms and the, the differences in philosophy between Booker T. Washington and you know, W.E.B. Du Bois and the kind of importance of it in the context of that time period. So I highly recommend that if you're interested in, know more in knowing more about this particular divide. So anyway, um, you know, Du Bois was convinced that logical, scientifically grounded arguments alone would never convince white Americans of the true workings of racial discrimination and prejudice. So he started to write with a more soulful voice because he recognized that race doesn't work, exist, or work or exist solely at the rational level. So this is when he starts to take that turn from, I can prove that, you know, through my own deeds and through my own life that African Americans have every, you know, capability as white Americans do. But then at some point he realized, you know, even if you show people research and logically grounded empirical work, if they still believe in racism, they're not going to be able to see it, right? So he started to kind of change his work a bit to recognize that as well. So um, there's some really crucial methodological lessons within the souls of black folks. So the working of such complex phenomena as race and class cannot be fully understood using only scientific means. Du Bois explored the subjectivity because he believed that race and racism did not work at a strictly rational level. Whereas Du Bois sought to combine empirical, scientific, and historical data with more subjective, intuitive understandings, postmodernists deny the existence of social scientific ways of knowing altogether, claiming that all knowledge in the end is subjective and idiosyncratic. So he was, again, very ahead of his time when it comes to developing these methodological approaches that nowadays we would say, oh, of course, postmodernists this, or, you know, of course, you know, when looking at a different way to interpret things in a social scientific lens since the 1980s that's been, you know, accepted. But he was well ahead of his time talking about these kind of things and looking at these topics within these contexts, like, like decades ahead. Um, so three interrelated concepts um, are present within the souls of black folks. And this is part of why it's important theoretically because he talks about the color line, double consciousness, and the veil, and shows how these concepts reflect the intertwined dimensions of race. So he wrote The Souls of White Folks, or this, this kind of you know, reflection, The Souls of White Folks, was really a reaction to the New Negro Movement. So this was originally published in 1910, but it was revised with references to World War I for republication in 1920. And sadly, albeit predictably, a lot of white people did not react well to the new Negro movement, <laughs> right? In 1919, 77 African Americans were lynched in various parts of the country, and racial tensions completely exploded in rural Arkansas in October 1919 after gunfire from black sharecroppers. And so we know this now, we're, we're seeing much more historical accounting for a lot of the brutality 
um, for the, you know, kind of racist riots where, you know, um, white people would storm into black communities and destroy them, kill people, lynch people, you know, the, um, and I, and in the book they explore, you know, Ida B. Wells Barnett and, you know, some of the people accounting for the issue of lynchings in the time period. Um, but really to, to boys, this, this spoke of something deeper, right? So he wanted to understand by trying to explore the white consciousness, right? So there are similarities in the books between souls of white folks and souls of black folk, but um, souls of white folk reads more militantly, where Du Bois reverses the gaze of racial domination. So here it is white consciousness, or the lack thereof, that's being explored. So the souls of white folks has been called the first major analysis in Western intellectual history to probe deeply into white identity and the meanings of whiteness. So he's really the first to talk about this idea of white privilege, something invisible to whites. Right, something that we take for granted now, again, another concept. The idea that if you live in a society that privileges you and sets you as the baseline, you often don't have to see the, through the perspectives of, of others so you don't see the kind of privilege that you live within. Right? So Du Bois contended that you know, while African Americans have a double consciousness, whites have no racial consciousness at all. However, Du Bois suggested that unknown to whites, African Americans can see what it means to be white that blacks have this clairvoyance that comes from their servile position in society, and therefore, you know, as servants in one form or another, they're exposed to the intimate details of whites' lives, so they see whites as they really are. And so, obviously, Du Bois contemned whites, not only for their hypocrisy, but for their delusions. And so Du Bois declared that white Christianity was a miserable failure, because the number of whites who actually practiced, quote, the democracy and unselfishness of Jesus Christ, end quote, is so small as to be farcical. So too Du Bois finds the U.S. call to make the world safe for democracy ludicrous, right? How can you, how can you make the world better when you haven't made your own society fair for the people within it? So of course this is the same message that was preached by Dr. Martin Luther King, albeit you know slightly more positively about 30 years later, but it really does show again just how foundational and important W.B. Du Bois's work and arguments were to how not just we understood you know race and racism in his time period, but still in our analysis of race and racism in society today.